welcome to Tar Heel Teachers Presents Supporting LGBTQIA Youth in North Carolina. I'm Marlo Artis. Over the past few decades, acceptance for and inclusion of the LGBTQIA community has grown tremendously, but there's still much work to be done. LGBTQIA youth face high levels of discrimination, bullying, rejection, and stress, especially in the school setting where they spend most of their time. High levels of childhood stress can impact their lifelong mental, emotional, and physical well-being, in addition to their academic performance. According to the Trevor Report, LGBTQIA youth are almost five times more likely to have attempted suicide in comparison to their heterosexual peers. Providing support to this population should be a priority. We are very fortunate to have a great lineup to discuss the supports and resources that are available to LGBTQIA youth here in North Carolina. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Marla. So excited to have each of you here. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is to have our panel to introduce yourselves. Please share your preferred pronouns and also tell us a little bit about your organization. I'll pop in first. Hey y'all, my name is Rebby Kern. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Director of Education Policy at Equality North Carolina. Um, a big role in my work. I I'm so grateful to see all of these familiar faces on the panel today. Um, and so many of us doing similar work across the state and um, to see this work really seated in the needs of folks who are navigating the education system in school, out of school, and then even looking at um, uh, youth in care, um, youth in custody care, and how they are also accessing education. A um, uh, little bit about ENC, I'm sure I'll have time to talk about, um, but we are a statewide organization serving the needs of lived equality for LGBTQ North Carolinians through policy and programs. Thank you, Rebby. I'll go ahead and go next. Um, I'm Shelly O'Rourke. I'm with the, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm with the Frank Carr Foundation in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm the executive director. Um, we serve Eastern North Carolina, up and down the coast. We have uh, programs for youth, elders, and everybody in between. Um, part of our mission is to educate the public at large on LGBTQ issues and acceptance and make sure that our community has more affirming and accepting spaces here and that our people can uh, walk freely through our streets and feel comfortable and safe. And that includes our children. So I appreciate very much you having us on today. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. My name is Craig White. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. I'm the supportive schools director with the Campaign for Southern Equality. Uh, CSE is a regional Southern organization. Our mission is to support the lived and legal equality of LGBTQ people in the South. So we have several programs, including a micro grants program, the Southern Equality Fund. We have a community health program that promotes uh, LGBTQ access to health care and mental health care. Um, and we have my work, which is the Supportive Schools Program, advocating for Southern schools to be fully welcoming and inclusive of LGBTQ plus students in every Southern state and every Southern school district. Be Great. glad to Thank talk you, a little bit more about that work later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, my name is Roy Philbrick. I use he, him pronouns. I am with, I am on the board of Youth Outright, a queer youth organization in Asheville, serving Western North Carolina. Um, I just tell, us, tell us a little bit about Youth Outright and the work that you all do, Roy. Uh, we work. We work with youth teaching sex education, gender, gender studies, and sexuality. We help. We help. Um, we help uplift youth. We help uplift youth's views and make sure they get some leadership. We have a. We have some youth staff. It's ages 11 to 20. Yes. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Roy, for being here. We really appreciate it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just a couple months ago, a few months ago, NCDPI actually updated PowerSchool to display each student's preferred um, name on most student records except for their student transcript. So can we talk a little bit about why that's a game changer for our youth? Um, and Craig, if you could start. Yeah, I'll begin by talking a little bit about the policy background, um, and then maybe, maybe Rebbe, you can talk about what it's meant um, for students this year. Uh, so this is a, an advocacy initiative that started um, for me in the Campaign for Southern Equality back in 2017, when we had a couple of school districts, uh, Buncombe County, Asheville City Schools, and Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, that at the district level had passed policies to respect the chosen names or affirmed names of students as well as their affirmed pronouns. But what they had found was that PowerSchool, which probably most of our audience knows is the uh, student information system that the state of North Carolina requires schools to use, that platform only allowed for the listing of the student's legal name. So if a student was using their chosen name at school, the school was respecting that but then any, um, anything using the PowerSchool platform was using their legal name. Potentially that could out them, reveal their transgender status, reveal um, their legal name and the gender that they were assigned at birth, uh, which of course is a violation of privacy laws, both at the district policy level as well as state and federal privacy laws. Uh, so that seemed a, like a pretty clear fix that needed to be made at the state level. Uh, so, for a couple of years, uh, the Campaign for Southern Equality, Equality North Carolina, and some other groups have been advocating with the Department of Public Instruction to get that fix in the power school system. Uh, it was promised a couple of times, but then it finally rolled out this spring. There are some things that still need to be fixed in power school, um, but it was a pretty important step uh, for North Carolina to take, again, that most Southern states have not yet taken. What's really important that Craig mentioned is what happens when the inverse is the lived reality for folks, um, when names and pronouns are not honored in school. You heard Marlo read some really jarring statistics in the beginning about um, mental health for trans and queer young people navigating through school systems. Um, when young people are frequently outed, um, and that's any time their uh, gender identity, their sexual orientation, is shared with others without their permission or consent, that's essentially called outing. And this happens um, uh, frequently in systems, which is why organizations across the region and state have been working so hard um, to navigate in CDPI in a way to create, because this is what the whole state is using. And so um, what a great small fix that impacts all 100 counties of North Carolina. Um, the ongoing impacts, when I think about a young person, um, you know, leaving their pillow in the morning and um, making their way to an educational space um, and then returning back, how many aggressions can happen moment to moment? So let's say when they get to their homeroom, um, their name isn't honored, their pronouns aren't honored, and that person then from homeroom to first period all the way through to the end of school, this could happen over and over even if their peers, even if their families are giving them that gender support and identity support. And so by the time they get home, you can only imagine um, after microaggression, after microaggression um, that has long-term impacts. Um, the Trevor Project um, also took a look at these long-term impacts and um, what a year 2020 was. And the release of this upgrade was so important because once we went online, this was exacerbated. And um, while some schools and districts had workarounds for chosen names, once we went online, that kind of wiped away any best practice that we might have had in school. Um, and so it's been incredible to watch schools who are returning um, for full in person um, for students to advocate for themselves with their school districts um, and, and their administrators and educators. Um, so we're, we're happy to see it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other thoughts about that? Well, I do need to weigh in that, um, you know, like a lot of things, a policy change is not necessarily always result in a change in practices. 
Um, and Roy, uh, Shelly, Rebbe, I'm not sure what y'all saw this spring, but I had a flood of, of calls and questions um, during April and May of students whose name may or may not have been changed in power school, but they were seeing uh, their previous name, what a lot of people call their dead name, um, show up on their end of grade testing um, or having um, the school district insist that their dead name is going to be read at graduation. Um, and so, you know, in each of those cases, I needed to guide the student or the parent or guardian or teacher, you know, here are your rights. Here's the policy from the Department of Public Instruction. Um, and as far as I know, in every case, it worked out. Um, but cisgender students just get those benefits without having to fight for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and having to fight for those rights in the face of all the daily microaggressions that Rebbe is talking about, in the midst of a pandemic when so many students are struggling anyway, um, in the midst of honestly a racial equity crisis for our nation, when so many students of color are really struggling with, does this country want me? Does this country accept me? Am I safe? in my hometown? Am I safe in my home? That's a lot to lay on young people. And we're talking about between 15 and 45,000 transgender um, North Carolina K-12 students. And Craig, one thing that you were quoted as saying, um, there is not a downside other than the respect for students. So when we think about that small change, it makes such a big impact. And we do have to make sure that we're showing that level of respect for all of our students. So um, one thing in terms of training, um, we know that there are various trainings that are available, but sometimes individuals don't know about the training that's available. When I worked in Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools, I was able to take the Safe Zone training because we had an equity director who was able to reach out to the LGBTQ Center at UNC, and I was able to um, get that training. But that was after I had left the classroom. So we don't have any requirements for teachers to have any type of training as they're getting their certification. So can we talk about the training and how can we make sure that the training is more accessible and more teachers are able to access it? Sure, I'll, we run a safe zone training program here in Wilmington and, and down the coast. And we were set up to have uh, teachers take our training pre-pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, once things shut down, everybody had to retool and we weren't able to get that happening this last year, uh, but we are having plans to have our school staff, uh, administration and teachers, as well as support staff, uh, take tra safe zone training uh, here in New Hanover County. We also though, and I think other centers do this too, offer safe zone training to individuals. So if a teacher has not, or a administrator, or someone who is support staff has not um, had an opportunity to take a safe zone training, I believe they can reach out. I know they can reach out to our organization and other LGBTQ centers across the state and um, take that initiative to go ahead and, and get trained up to provide affirming space for their students. Um, so I, I do think that's something that is available for everyone. We just have to maybe look for it a little harder than, <laughs> than we need to, but, um, and, and we wanna make sure that that's available for everybody that works with anyone in the public, but especially our children. And when I think about the piece about um, accessibility, um, thinking through who's receiving the trainings, and knowing that um, trainings for K-5 staff um, will look very different from high school, um, school counselors and social workers. And, um, and I really have to reiterate that some of these conversations will overlap, um, though others might need to be specific to those serving young folks and their families at these ages. Um, when we think about elementary school folks, we need to think about equity for the families coming in um, as well and, and will um, you know, a family with two trans parents be welcomed in as much as, um, as a cis heterosexual couple coming in. And so those pieces are important and can help um, break through the fears of, isn't it too early in elementary school to talk about these topics? Um, our staff are impacted by these policies as well. We have plenty of LGBTQ and trans staff 
navigating education spaces um, in our state and they deserve to be seen and have an easeful process for name updates and, and to be able to talk about um, their lives in a, in a really fair way. Um, and of course, the virtual space has, has kind of opened things up where educators can log in from wherever they are. Uh, I hope that there's some hybrid offerings as we move into the fall, um, but wherever educators are able to fit, um, 90 minutes would be phenomenal. I know sometimes you can only get 45 to 50 and ongoing. Um, so much changes, uh, legislative session to legislative session and year to year and season to season. And that ongoing piece that Shelly mentioned is crucial. And I just think it would also, go ahead, go ahead, Craig. Well, I was gonna see if Roy wanted to speak to any of youth out rights work in this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, with training, I think um, the training I think is very important. Like Ravi said, Ravi said to have each uh, elementary school training, and maybe even elementary school training, middle school training, and high school training different, because it's all different levels. Like it's all different levels. Uh, Training needs to be diverse, not just LGBT, but like, but like disabled disabilities. Uh, uh, racism, stuff like that. Uh, just intersections. Yeah, that's, I actually, yeah, that's a great point, Roy. That's something that K through five, we just have to teach kindness, right? And acceptance. I mean, that is that is safe zone training. <laughs> it's kindness and acceptance. Um, and that's really all that I think anyone is really asking for, is for our children to be taught to be accepting and kind to each other and to honor themselves and be kind to themselves, right? So, right, the K through five, it's not a, it, it's something that we should be doing pretty easily. So that all children, regardless of how they fit into our society, uh, feel safe and accepted. I've actually known a lot of K through five students that should probably be leading these trainings for adults, just because they're not so indoctrinated in this idea of binary gender and, and gender stereotypes having to look a particular way. Um, you know, first graders who are like, yeah, you know, whoever can show up wearing a dress or, you know, a prince's gown, and they're just okay with that. Um, or the, the kids that will correct a substitute teacher and say, you know, oh no, this student uses they, them pronouns, right? Um, it's just part of their natural world. And, um, you know, even it, it's really important that we talk about the struggles and the challenges um, that LGBTQIA plus young, young people face. But I don't want to just talk about the deficits. I also want to talk about the, the strength and the resiliency and the beauty and the creativity and the power um, of these young people. I mean, that's why I do this work because it just feeds my spirit so much. Um, and I truly believe that these, that these young folks that are breaking through these, um, you know, what I grew up with, all these old kind of rigid gender stereotypes, I, I think that they're carrying the liberation of all of us um, in, in their hands. Um, and, and what a profound gift. Um, and teachers know that, you know, the young people teach us as much as we teach them. And what do you think that has really prompted um, this generation of young people to be able to have that level of freedom? Um, because, you know, we can see that there's been so much progression and we have, you know, social media and we also have more visibility in the media as well. So what do you all think really helps to lend young people to have that level of, of strength and bravery? I'm going to defer to Roy on this one. <laughs> um, uh, well, having not to be a little dark, but having an older generation, because the generation above me didn't really have an older generation to due to the pay, the, um, the AIDS epidemic. Sorry, I shake. The AIDS epidemic. Um, 
just learning more, willing to learn from each other, willing, having awesome adults like you. Oh, wait, I'm an adult. Having awesome elders like you guys, or just having, having, uh, just having generations and generations and generations. The more, the, the younger generation, the more bolder that you're gonna get. Like, cause you actually like, um, Sorry. Boy, could you talk about the, um, I know that you've been with Youth Right, um, Youth Outright, even as a teen and how beneficial that was to have that community space where you were able to be surrounded by individuals who were also um, in your community and you know it was a safe space. How, how beneficial was that? I've been with Youth Outright for seven years now, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I've been there since I was like 17, 16, 17, 18. I don't, um, having other people who understand you helps a lot. Having, having people your age also educating you. Like we, we have, when we get in, at Youth Hour, right, when we have, people when we do lessons it's mostly the youth teaching the youth teaching the youth not the fellow youth not really the adults teaching them uh because like when i was a youth i would teach gen gender and sexuality or sex ed to other youth it's just easier to learn because you're not having an adult looking down at you or feeling like they might know more than you. So just having fellow youth, having a safe space to be yourself, having, yeah, just having fellow youth, having a safe space to be yourself, having elder queers looking out for you, just stuff like that. Thank you for that. And Shelly, you all make sure that you empower the youth um, at the Frank Hare Center, you um, foundation, excuse me, you all have the youth steering committee. So tell us about that. Yeah, our youth steering committee has been on a little bit of a hi hiatus because of COVID. They are high school students that did not want to be on Zoom any more than necessary. Um, but they are getting back together this summer. Uh, and, you know, I couldn't be prouder of our youth. Um, our, our youth steering committee goes and does tabling at festivals. They show up at the health fairs. Um, they do uh, drug misuse prevention. They teach each other about um, where to go if you're in a crisis or have a homeless situation or your family's not accepting. Um, they, they teach about Narcan and resources for you know, other um, drug and alcohol issues. They do sex ed, they're condom ambassadors for our county. So the county gives them condoms and they go out and distribute them among the youth. I could sit at a booth all day with a big bucket of condoms and there will not be one teenager that will come up to me. <laughs> they're just <laughs> not gonna do it. <laughs> so, but, but when the kids, when you have some you know, 17, 16 year old kids standing there, they are mobbed and they're taking every pamphlet and they're learning about, about um, the, the language of, of sex ed that is inclusive and expansive. So um, the pamphlets that we put out say things like, um, if you have ovaries and you have sex with someone who makes sperm, you may become pregnant. You know, it's just, it makes more sense to the kids. They don't want to hear a heteronormatives. They don't care. <laughs> they like they want the biology basics to be safe and healthy, um, but they also want to be able to really feel like they are who they are. And and when you have youth doing peer education, 
Um, like Roy was talking about, it is just so much more impactful. Um, it's one of the reasons why we need GSAs in all the schools. We need to make sure that kids can talk to kids and that we're supporting them in those ways too. And talking about um, the talking about the um, sex education standards, they're not as inclusive as you know they need to be. So they don't necessarily include information about sexual orientation or gender identity. According to CECUS, um, the sex ed for social change, only 58% of North Carolina's high school students received any type of instruction around sexual orientation or gender identity. So how do we make those changes? I know there's some communities where there are community-based organizations that help to fill in those gaps or partner with the school district, but how do we make sure that all of our students um, have access to that comprehensive um, sex education that is representative of all of our students? I'm sure Craig and I both have a lot to say here. <laughs> Uh, and, it, you know, Craig alluded to it earlier when they were discussing the ways that policy and culture changes happen sometimes at different times, sometimes interdependently. Um, and what I've been seeing from a policy perspective is there, there are big spaces of growth that can become possible here um, to shift policy around sexual health education from um, abstinence only until heterosexual marriage to abstinence only until marriage was a big deal for, for, for one word of a shift. Yes. And so um, we have a long way to go. And there are many states in, in the U.S. right now who are still facing um, the long term harms of abstinence only education. Um, when it comes to culture, we, we have to ensure like what each of us have shared already um, that educators are prepared to have conversations in a way that is age appropriate, medically accurate, and, and brave for every student in the classroom. I can't guarantee a safe space for every child every day, but I can certainly ensure that our students, our families, and our educators are approaching conversations with bravery. Um, and, and that's such an important part here. Um, it, I have to give up um, this, this long time fear that some folks might have around what young people will do with this information. Um, Roy teaches me every single day, young people will make great decisions about their bodies when given the best education possible. Um, and, and I'm sure Craig can, can expand even more deeply based on their work in the, in the region as well. Yeah, I would piggyback that. Um... This is just a place where we need leadership from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and we need leadership from the North Carolina State Board of Education, um, frankly. Uh, the political landscape right now is such that LGBTQIA plus young people, especially trans and non-binary young people have been placed on the front lines of the culture wars, you know literally hundreds of bills proposed in different state legislatures just this year, just within the last five months, um, attacking trans kids, right? Um, that's, that's not okay. And, and we need, um, you know, those of us who do advocacy work, we are okay with fighting the battles in the legislatures, in the courts, right? That's our job, we can do that, we're ready for that. What we can't do is be there for every student in every district across the South and across the country. So we really need the Department of Education and other state agencies to stand up and say, look, y'all have your culture war over there. If you need to do that, you go ahead and do that. What we are gonna do is make sure that every student of every sexual orientation, every racial and ethnic identity, every gender identity, every form of gender expression, they are gonna be safe and they are gonna be supported in every school in North Carolina, period, non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. And what I hear when I work with superintendents and principals in, in rural school districts and conservative school districts, they do get some of that political pushback. They're willing to take that on because they care about their students so much. They'll take that burden, they'll take that heat personally, but they can't do it if they don't have the guidance and support from DPI at the state level, right? So we really, really need that state level leadership. 
because the support is being provided for individual students, but we need that systemic change, those systemic policies and, and systems in place so we can make sure that that support is offered across the board, even in those resistant communities. Exactly, it should not matter. Um, you know, a six-year-old does not get to decide whether they're growing up in Chapel Hill, right? Or whether they're growing up in Rocky Mount or whether they're growing up in Mount Erie, right? Um, they need to know that they're safe and supported wherever they're going to school. And I have yet to talk to a teacher or a principal or a superintendent who says, no, I want to harm my kids. That's what I'm here for, right? Sometimes they don't know. They often haven't had the training, you know, to understand what is a non-binary gender identity, right? Mm -hmm. We can do that. That training is out there. Um, the commitment to keep students safe and supported is, is there. And, and generally, you know, that's the leverage to, to work with folks. If that's not there, please give me a call. We have a legal team. <laughs> yeah, exactly what Craig said. I mean, that six-year-old, um, nobody should be um, politicizing that child's identity, right? That child's identity is who they are. And all we need to do is support that child, right? We can have a political fight somewhere else, but when it comes to... Um, taking care of our children, we need to take care of the whole of them. And the last thing I'll say about this, Marlon, and then I'll, I'll pass it back is um, we also have to, to take a, a, a macro look and notice, notice that the same conversations and resistance to um, inclusive, um, medically accurate, age appropriate um, sexual health information for young folks is similar resistance to trans kiddos um, participating in sports in school and very similar to the resistance of the critical race theory, not curriculum, theory. And, and, and so I have to name that and make those connections. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure we could be here for three hours, Marlo, and, and I appreciate the questions that you're bringing forward, but that's just the one thing that I wanna name here. When you talk about the big shift, and Generation Z is done with the way that we've been sitting at this table for so long. And people in movement history have talked about this pro proverbial table of needing a seat of power to get anything done. Namely, many of us work inside systems to do so. Um, and the, the generation right now, they're hacking Wall Street in a way that's impactful. Um, and they're saying no more, that, that, that these systems have created enough harm and we're not up for this anymore. Mm -hmm. Or did you want to add anything? Me? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> my, mm -hmm. my computer's lagging. Um, like, like Rebbe was saying, we're kind of, we're just done with these table to be on these tape. Hmm. On. To have these tables where you have to be like rich or white or cis or straight and have to deal with come on, cis, straight, white to be at the table. We're done. We want diversity. We want some, we, we don't want some cis straight person talking to about talking for us, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Rip, uh, Roy. So um, Rebby talked about it a moment ago in terms of the resistance to um, transgender youth participating in high school sports. You know, there's such a big um, bullhorn discussion about that. When you actually look at the numbers, fewer than 10 students over the last two years have even attempted to participate. So Craig, where is that resistance coming through? Um, and why is that such a big topic when we don't even, it's, it's a small percentage of students that wanna participate and those students should have a right to. Yeah, so um, here's a shout out to the um, social studies teachers, uh, the civics teachers out there. This is what's called a manufactured issue. Um, there is no real issue here. 
there are serious issues around gender equity in sports, um, some of which are finally getting some, some press. Uh, the way that our support, that our society uh, supports and resources uh, cisgender male athletes compared to women's teams um, is, is outrageous and harmful and has been for decades. Um, so talking about trans athletes being a, being a threat to sports is, um, is red herring the term? It's a distraction. It's a fake issue. It's a made up issue. Um, yeah, I'll, let me pass it to Rebby. I know y'all have been working on this as well, but I just don't even <laughs> want to give it the airtime because it's just ridiculous and silly. I'm typing notes here, Craig, because this is something that you and I have definitely been side by side on in the last few months. Um, one thing I will name is that um, the legislation that showed up in North Carolina, the three bills attacking trans youth in sport and uh, trans access to gender affirming health care, as well as the widening of religious refusals, um, have all um, died essentially in the state. And so I want to name that for, for folks that are tuning in who might not have been tracking. Um, and, and what I will say of, of the egregious bill that was proposed in the state um, legislators were attacking kiddos in middle school, high school, and college. Um, and, and Craig has named a number of systems and the accountability that needs to be upheld to these folks um, in, in care. There's already an entity uh, governing sports, high school sports in North Carolina, who are acting in, in support of gender identity. And, and, and this is, is major. So there was no issue in North Carolina. We actually had um, a, a fair policy for, for our state. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and Marla, what I do want to name, and, and, and the NCAA has been doing work. It's been a long journey, right? And there's much to, to do left. Um, but what I want to name, Marlo, is that um, when you mention the small number of trans youth participating, it actually has more to do with the culture of sports right now in middle school, high school, and college. Um, and, and, and Craig alluded to this as well, is, is uh, if we are running culture separate from policy, then we can change a hundred policies. However, the culture may not shift. Um, and uh, in what way are schools really addressing their fan base um, their um, coaches and athletic directors, um, their players, the participants, as well as broadening out recreational um, sports um, for folks who are not interested in, in participating in inter-school um, athletics. There is a lot to be done here in, in very gender-specific um, playgrounds and fields um, for, for our young athletes. And so there's a much bigger need here. And when it comes to the legislation, Craig's 100% right. Um, this is a larger lashback. We saw this in 2016 when 200 bills were introduced after marriage equality became the, the law of the land. So a lot has happened at the end of 2020 and 2021 has brought a whole new slate of, of um, what's holding our attention. Um, and so once again, we're seeing um, uh, with the new administration coming in a very similar now over 250 bills, 17 of which have been adopted in states across the United States. And so um, the fight's not over and trans people have been doing great things forever. <laughs> without need of legislation and without need for supervision and, and the, uh, the internal attention. So I have to name that as well. <laughs> That's <laughs> absolutely that. right. Um, I think the other thing is um, there are some bills where trans athlete bans have passed. Um, there's there are some states where um, trans healthcare uh, for young people has been limited by law. And those are being challenged in the, in the courts. But the impact of these is not limited to the young people that live in that state, right? Um, it, it has a chilling effect. It has an exclusionary effect on young people everywhere of saying, they don't want me. I'm not welcome. I'm not welcome as a soccer player. I'm not welcome in school. I can't be myself. I can't bring my whole self to that game or, the, or that table. Um, 
And in North Carolina, even before the bill was introduced, um, I was working with a young person who had switched school districts when they transitioned um, because their previous school district had been so hard. They showed up in their new district, a district with affirming policies, a district with a very affirming culture. Um, and, and this kid ran. Um, they ran track, they ran cross country. That was their escape. That was their identity. They were so excited to go out for track this spring and then they decided not to. Mm. They, they took a look at, um, there is a path for them to compete as their affirmed gender um, through the policies of the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. And it's a pretty burdensome path. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of letters from doctors and affirmations from, you know, however many different people that you are, the gender that you say you are. Um, it just wasn't worth it to them. So they left behind this, this key piece of their resiliency, you know, and this, this key piece of their identity um, had to be left behind just because of this toxic culture around trans youth in sports. What we need is athletic directors and principals and superintendents and school board members who are really standing up to say sports are for everyone. Not just the super athletic kid that may be you know, hoping for a scholarship, but sports are about teamwork, sports are about physical fitness, sports are about being the best person that you can be, sports are about being in touch with your body, whatever that body is. Um, we, at whatever level of competition, right? I, sorry, I feel really strongly about this, but, but athleticism and ath access to, to athletic opportunities is a right in some ways, right? And um, just to deny that to some of our kids because they don't fit some 19th century gender stereotypes is, is ridiculous and offensive. Mm -hmm. Shelly, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, just on that, my I actually am the parent of a trans son and um, he is out of high school now, but he was an athlete and, and chose not to compete. Um, even though he did have supportive family, supportive community, um, it was, as Craig said, too burdensome. It was just too hard. And, uh, and it's heartbreaking because that is part of, of his middle school experience, his high school experience that he didn't get, you know? His, his pictures of, his, of him in his soccer uniform ended in grade school. But he really wanted to take that on. And that's just heartbreaking, um, you know, that he doesn't have that, that photograph of him and the team. Thank you for sh um, sharing that, Shelly. That is heartbreaking. Um, Rabbi, I do want to give you an opportunity to talk about the Rural um, Youth Empowerment Fellowship because you know, a lot of times we know what's happening in your, um, urban communities, but we are um, seeing some gains in the rural sector as well. So can you talk about that? Yeah, um, and thank you for, for naming that. Um, uh, data and data and data shows, one, that um, rural communities are deeply under-resourced um, and that queer people from rural communities have deep, deep sense of pride um, for their home community. And, and, and there are big misconceptions that queer people don't like living in, in rural South. Um, there is strong community, there's strong chosen family there and, and strong pride. Um, and so what this looks like is, is also um, uh, uh, an awareness that what works in large cities will not work in rural communities. And so what we've been able to do over the past three years is adapt a program. It's, it's different each year as that learning grows um, to redistribute resources back into rural communities. And so through the Rural Youth Empowerment Fellowship, um, we encourage folks from rural communities to apply and um, they spend a year with us um, gaining uh, tools for, for movement growth, um, everything from environmental justice to um, queering sex education in schools. And, and what they then gain from those connections is, is we bring in folks who are doing that work on the ground and to lead content. Um, I am 
no expert. I, I don't believe anybody is ever an expert in anything except maybe their own experience. Um, and so it really flattens that hierarchy that you have to have a, an MBA and be a professor at a school to be knowledgeable um, on an, any topic. And so just watching that deconstruction of power happen in this space is, is really beautiful and is really impactful. Um, and, and I'm thrilled to, to be a part of the program as sort of you know, the program lead in that way. Um, so for folks that are tuning in, um, if you are from and have a deep connection to rural communities in North Carolina, um, please check out equalitync.org slash rye as in rural youth empowerment. Um, and we'd love to get your interest in that as well. Great. Are there any other resources that anyone would like to share? Um, we will in the description box of this video, um, share some links and resources uh, best practices. So um, are there any other resources anybody would like to share while we're talking about it? Oh, there's lots. Um, you know, North Carolina, um, North Carolina is one of the top states in the Southeast when it comes to having an infrastructure of, of support and organizing and advocacy for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, you sometimes have to go looking for it, um, especially in the rural parts of the state, but it is there. Um, so ask around and, and you'll find it. Um, I, I wanna highlight in addition to the work that Shelley is doing in the East, um, the Peel Center at Eastern Carolina University is available for training and outreach to teachers. Um, again, really important work and, and, they're, and they're working in, in rural North Carolina. Um, Roy's here and can represent Youth Outright for Western North Carolina, um, but the work that, that Youth Outright is doing uh, is, is really, really amazing. Um, my work, the Supportive Schools Program with the Campaign for Southern Equality, again, we serve multiple Southern states, but what my work tends to be is advising uh, school administrators and school districts and school boards on what it looks like to develop and then uh, pass and then implement LGBTQ plus inclusive policies and practices. Uh, so we do a little bit less of the direct teacher training. Um, our preference is that local organizations usually have the better connection for that, uh, but we can do some of the policy advising. Um, sometimes the stuff that gets a little politically hot, um, it's fine to, to bring me or my colleagues in to take that heat. That's great, it's good to have all those various resources. Boy, did you want to say something? Go ahead, Shelley. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, Onslow County also has a new LGBTQ center, and they are also doing safe zone training, um, both in person and on Zoom. Yeah, that's great. So uh, we should certainly mention the Durham state. Center as well. Uh, right, they, right. They have a lot of programs going on, and don't just serve Durham and Durham County. Right, yeah, that's well, the well. Yeah, and now with Zoom, you know, you can, you can get a training anywhere. <laughs> We go right to your living room. <laughs> so true, and safe um, schools, North Carolina as well. So, I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many different organizations like Rebby said earlier, there's a lot of cross section and people are just really, you know, trying to um, address this topic and provide resources in so many different ways. So it's really, really important. Um, can we talk about briefly some of the things and stories that we've heard in terms of how um, LGBTQIA youth have been impacted by the pandemic? I defer to Roy first here. Um, well, like we said earlier, the with the in, with with the uh, birth name on with the birth name on the computer and stuff that's been affecting. Uh, technically, I'm still a youth. <laughs> um, so it's been affecting a lot. Uh, the school, like I, I have autism, so learning through the computer instead of learning in person, it's been effect. It's been so neurodivergent for youth. They've been having to learn a different way than they used to. Or the use, yeah. Um, uh, 
it's been affecting my friends by just how, like, yeah, you can do it at home, but you have this, you have this, you could have this unaccepting family and have a everybody on the computer call you one thing and then your family could out you or or you could be outed by to your family so like all that like all your friends before covid so like oh we're going to call you the name you go by then they get they they call you that in person and for the computer and your family figures out and then stuff could happen so like so like yeah that's true boy thank you sure we each have so much to add here um the the deep isolation was not unique to the lgbtq community um, though it was deeply felt um, and, and even the deep connections of loss and, and grief that, um, you know, uh, people who are in their, their 50s remember so vividly about um, losing friends um, during the early AIDS crisis. Um, and then so those pieces were, were really um, deeply felt. There was also there is still joy. There's still joy to be had. And, and I want viewers um, to also witness that while there was pain and hurt, there was also power and pride and that all of those happen together at the same time. Um, when there's pride, that, that hurt doesn't go away. And, um, and so while it became challenging in so many ways to acclimate to this new way of being, it also... <laughs> was reminiscent of the 90s of logging in and, and having a chat room to, to connect to friends. Um, you know, Zoom and, and, and uh, digital video platforms offered this. Shout out to Discord and so many people finally discovering what Discord is because it had been running for a very long time and, and really fed to Roy's point about, um, you know, what does nonverbal support look like for people who can't um, verbalize who they are um, in an unsafe, um, unbrave environment. And so um, uh, that has become really important. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to everybody on Twitch. I'm not necessarily a gamer. Zelda is my pride and joy for sure. Um, but there have been enough variety streams by um, BIPOC, trans and queer gamers that I can just tune in and feel like I'm, I'm, I'm among friends. Um, and then so people that have opened up their homes to us in that way, even just to receive um, a sense of, of being seen, um, created a lifeline uh, for many folks. And I've heard those stories. And um, the last thing I'll name too is the importance of capturing this history, um, what it is like um, for LGBTQ people and BIPOC people and disabled people navigating through this time, how will we capture this moment in history? We know that our, I know my history as a brown person, um, uh, as a queer person, as a person living with an invisible disability, that my story isn't told. I don't always have access to it. And Generation Z continues to teach me that I have the power to tell that story and, and to offer that to my community. And so um, I, I want this to be captured and, and to be able to look back and say, we survived that, we did that. <laughs> and so um, there's a lot to be had. I'm excited to hear um, what other folks have, have experienced as well. Thank you. Um, I think our youth, really did suffer a great deal of isolation as well as our elders. I mean, just in our community, um, yeah, just ag everywhere, um, just that immediate disconnect from friends, from support networks, from the people who, you know, as Roy said, call you by your chosen name. Um, and, and losing that is, 
is really um, outrageously challenging, especially for kids. Um, I think, but like uh, as I mentioned, also the the online platforms that now we have someone in one of our um, our Pride Youth Group that joins us from the East West Coast because they were friends with someone here and then now they're in, they didn't have a youth group where they were in their town and now they're in our youth group. And that's really sweet, you know? So there's also the, it's an odd, an odd expansion and retraction all at the same time. <laughs> People had to find a different way. Um, and not everyone is as fortunate to find that way. And I feel like we're still kind of looking for those kids um, to make sure that they're okay. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but it is nice to see the new resources and the new accessibility for folks too. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, I would just add that it, inside or outside of the pandemic, um, the, the formula that I hope for for a young person is that they've got three things. One, they've got a supportive family or home environment that accepts them for who they are. They've got a supportive school environment and a supportive school culture that respects and celebrates who they are. And they've got some supportive social group or peer group, whether that's in person and or online, that supports and celebrates who they are. And young people that have those three things, that triangle is very, very stable. Right, and, and they can withstand um, a lot of microaggressions from the outside of that triangle. They can withstand a lot of legislators you know, saying junk about them in the General Assembly. Um, but if you take away any of the points of that triangle, it's a lot more fragile, right? So a young person without a supportive home, um, that's a really risky proposition or having a supportive home and supportive friends, but a hostile school environment, that's, that's a really risky place to be. Um, and unfortunately, I would, I, would, I would guess that a majority of, of North Carolina LGBTQIA students have a point on the triangle that's, that's, that's strong for them, but all three I think is fairly rare, um, unfortunately, because there are so few school districts that have really taken a stand to pass affirming policies. Um, there are so many families that have been fed stereotypes and misinformation about who their children are. Um, and there's so much hostility and bullying um, among peers, um, even, even now in the 21st century. Um, so teachers, uh, if you've got kids that you're worried about, look for that triangle and see how you can build the supports of that triangle and certainly do everything that you can to make that school a, a supportive environment. Thank you for that, Craig. And as we wrap up this episode, what's your call to action um, to the individuals who are watching, whether it's teachers, administrators, board members, superintendents, uh, members of the General Assembly, other community members and nonprofits, what's your call to action in terms of providing that support to LGBTQIA youth here in North Carolina? And Craig got us started off for sure. I think that yeah. that's, that crosses lots of sectors. Um, the one thing I'll broadly say um, is unlearn what you think you know. And, and that helps broaden things out. And, um, you know, I'll even use this, this example because I think it's a great learning moment. Um, before starting the panel, I remember writing Marlo and sharing my pronouns. And, and when we were getting started today, I noticed that Marlo had misgendered me and, and I gave myself permission to, um, to call that in and have a moment. And um, what that also looks like is that I'm not gonna get upset. I'm not gonna cancel somebody. Like this is a great learning moment for Marlo and I and everybody else watching. And, and what this means is there's an opportunity to understand those perceptions. What is my perception of people and how they arrive? I can know the definitions. I can read them verbatim. I can understand all 258 pronoun sets that might be out there. But if I don't know how my brain is processing human beings, then none of that is gonna matter and make that connection. And so that's, the, that's what I hope for everybody tuning in and, and watching this back um, is to check that bias and that will also 
um, help support people of all racial and ethnic identities, all gender identities and sexual orientations, all ages and, and disabilities. And so um, that would be my key takeaway. Um, you can follow my work through Equality NC to really understand the policy suggestions, but I'll leave that for the next episode. <laughs> Thank you, Rebby. Um, I had a thing. Keep an open mind about new identities that you do not know, because a lot of people are like, oh, I've never heard of the bisexuality or the transgender or being transgender, so it must not exist. If it exists, that means someone needs it. Like, sports did not exist before. It doesn't mean we don't need them. Like, <laughs> Just saying. Thank you, Roy. Yeah, I agree 100% with Roy. Um, you know, get trained up, um, learn about what's out there, learn about gender identity, you know, learn how to appropriately use pronouns. But like Roy was saying, you know, just respect people for their lived experience. And when they say who they are, just believe them because they know who they are, <laughs> you know, and just go with that. Um, that, that would be my number one advice. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's not that complicated, right? If you care about your students, if you respect your students, if you want them to be safe and supported, then, you know, you're 90% of the way there. And the, the other 10%, um, like Rebbe and Roy said, work on your unconscious bias. We've all got it, right? It's not a shame blame kind of thing. It's just, we've got work to do. Um, and you don't have to do work that's not yours, but whatever your sphere of influence is, whether that's a classroom, right? Whether that's the culture of the third grade at your elementary school, um, whether you're a superintendent and you've got your district, do what you can within your sphere of influence and trust that other folks are gonna pick up the rest, right? You don't have to do other people's work, but you do have to do your work. Absolutely, thank you so much, Craig. Thank you all so very much for joining us for this special conversation. We're so glad that you brought your experience and your expertise to this conversation. Um, and this will not be the last conversation that we have here on Tar Heel Teachers. Um, we're so glad that we were able to get the conversation started here on our platform, but we will continue to dive deep into this discussion because it's so important. I'd like to thank everybody so much for watching this episode of Tar Heel Teachers Presents, supporting LGBTQIA youth here in North Carolina. We look forward to seeing you soon.